Gaming Through the Ages isn't your typical Let's Play series, which you will quickly notice at times such as this. I've just crashed into a tree, but I want to talk about this tree I've crashed into. And this. These railings here are also... Look at that, those railings just disappeared. So there we go, they're cheeky 2D sprites hiding within this 3D world. I say these things because throughout this series I often take critical looks at the evolutions of graphics and gameplay as I play the games. You may also wonder why a person living in the year 2016 would say this. These graphics are just amazing. The reason I felt like that is because when I started this series playing a game made in 1975, I blocked out my knowledge of the real world and current video games. Well technically it took me a few episodes to remove my modern expectations, but by 1980 I'd adapted to the technology expectations of the time period. To get the most out of this series, it's best you do the same too. Forget everything you currently know about video games and look at TVs as simply fuzzy movie watching devices. Now imagine it's 1975 and you are seeing something fairly new. The ability to interact with a digital world on a screen. It may be ultra low res, only black and white and have a very limited playing area, but in time, video games will evolve and by watching phase one of gaming through the ages, you'll get to experience our move year by year in time through over 40 years in console gaming history. As new consoles are released, prepare to be amazed with the introduction of more colours, larger sprites, bigger more detailed game worlds, the move to 3D, increasingly intelligent AI and more, eventually leading up into what one day may become a digital world indistinguishable from real life. Okay, time to check out the adventure from beginning to end, summing up our 41 year journey that would take 15 hours to watch if you watched the full episodes. But in this video you can see the adventure in just over an hour. Also note the console controllers changed over time but I mapped PS4 controllers to work with all the games in this video. Although our journey was supposed to be set solely in the console world, our first game was actually Gunfight, played on an arcade machine in 1975. In this two player game, which also happens to only have two colours, black and yellow, players had to move their characters up, down, forwards and backwards to dodge bullets from the other player. As well as making the character walk up and down, you could also move their hand up and down to aim the gun. Bullets were limited each round and a short time limit was imposed on the game to keep the quarters rolling in. Although this game was limited to a single screen, there were a few variations in the positioning and existence of objects such as capped eye trees and wagons, which slightly changed up the feeling of the game each round. There were gunshot sounds that sounded like this. But unfortunately, due to an emulation error, we couldn't hear them while playing. I had to use Ben to help me in this episode as there was no artificial intelligence or single player mode in this game. After playing Gunfight, I briefly talked about the generation for video game consoles and how the second gen was just starting in 1976. One of the earliest second generation consoles was the Fairchild Channel F. Its maximum resolution was 128 x 64 pixels and it had a palette of 8 colours which is already an improvement over the gunfight game we just played which only had 2 colours. This was also the first console to have games stored on ROM cartridges, although there were only around 30 cartridges released in total. Viewers were then given the opportunity to pick any cartridge released in 1976 for the Fairchild Channel F console. But in the end, viewers chose Hockey, one of the two inbuilt Fairchild Channel F games. The goal in this two player game was to get the ball and the goal of the other player. The basic solid untextured graphics here were about as simple as the controls. Your um, background defender with one stick and then you can move your other stick up and down to move this other guy. Obviously there wasn't any storyline or hidden features in this game, so we challenged each other based on score. We'll make it first to ten, so first to ten points wins. It should be noted that although the Fairchild has eight colours in its palette, not all could be displayed on the screen at once, and there was a limit of four per line. As you can probably hear, only three different pitched beep sounds can come out of this system, but they can be modulated to produce different tones. In the end it was fairly close, but the winner was... Yes! Okay. Although we could have continued playing games on the Fairchild, we decided to upgrade to a new system, the Atari 2600. This thing had 128 bytes of RAM, which is double the amount the Fairchild Channel F had, and instead of just 8 colours, it could display up to 128 colours, but still only a maximum of 4 per line. Viewers were then told to leave a comment choosing which one of the 9 Atari 2600 launch titles I should play in the next episode. In the end, Street Racer got the most votes. This game had a ton of variations and game modes available. This game has 27 game variations. As I flip through these games, you can see 
There's lots of different variations, different amount of players, different styles of actual street racing games, and in some of them you're controlling a plane. We're going to play through um, 10 of the 27 different variations. Um, some of the variations require three and four players, so we're just going to do the two player variations. But once again, the graphics and gameplay were shallow and basic, with high scores being your only really true goal. First to 20 points once again wins. Oh, already. Sounds were improved over the Fairchild Channel F though. The six main sub-games we came across were Street Racer, which simply involved gaining points for dodging blue cars, Slalom, which involved attempting to ski down and pass through gates, because of the lack of textures, I guess, on the road that you're travelling on or whatever you're on, the lack of moving textures, it just looks like you're staying still and these objects are moving towards you as opposed to you actually moving down a hill and two gates. Dodgem, which involved riding along the track dodging green obstacles. Jet Shooter, which had you attempting to shoot and dodge enemy planes. Number Cruncher, in which you had to crash into numbers to add them to your score. What? How? Where did you get all those points from? And Scoot Ball, which was kind of strange. Basically, you have to try and catch the balls, then insert them into those computer scoopers, the ones that are open. After playing this game, we discovered that three new second gen consoles were released in 1978, but since they were all eventually discontinued before the Atari 2600, we decided to instead play another Atari game in hope that future games for the system would have multicoloured sprites, unlike all the single coloured sprites we'd seen in the previous games. Well, our prayers were answered in the next episode with Night Driver. So that one sprite there of that car has five colours. Anyway, as we keep driving, you'll see that there is a tree on the road. That's also a multicoloured sprite. Now this is what we're starting to see a lot with the Atari 2600. As time goes on, you're seeing more and more kind of multicoloured sprites and more colours on the screen at once, as opposed to what we had before with Street Racer. Anyway, this game had a few difficulty levels, but the gameplay was generally the same. Drive down the road super fast at night time without crashing into anything, including the edges of the road, to get the highest score possible before the time runs out. Yay! I got to 45 points! This was a single player game, but I did let Ben have a go on this episode to challenge my high score. Say goodbye to Ben though, because this was the last episode to feature him. Future games had various forms of artificial intelligence to verse instead. Next up, say hello to Adventure. This game certainly lived up to its name, as it was much more in depth than other games from its era. The object of the game is to rescue the enchanted chalice and place it inside the golden castle where it belongs. Sure that sounds simple, but this game has multiple castles opened up with their corresponding coloured keys with dragons trying to kill you and a bat messing with you as you're trying to make your way around. Don't get me, no! I'm now in the dragon's stomach, but this game does have a continue feature. It's not like we have to start all over again. On top of that, the world had multiple screens to navigate through, some with mazes and darkness to slow you down while searching for the keys and golden chalice. Oh, but where would the black key be? Some of the sprites here were actually animated, as opposed to the situations we had in earlier games where still sprites were moving around the screen. Ah, oh, the bat took the sword. Now, interesting thing we have here is an animated sprite. You can see it flapping up and down, I think. As great of a game as it was, it's a shame the Atari 2600 couldn't handle so many objects on the screen at once, which often resulted in flashing. How do you get this sword to get those dragons? Yes! So what I did is I just had the sword on the ground and the dragon flew into it. Our reward at the end of the game was pretty awesome. A colourful yes. display showing off tons of colours in the Atari 2600's palette. Okay, time to pick my favourite game from the late 1970s. They say newer doesn't always mean better, but in this case it was. Adventure for the Atari 2600 was my favourite due to the actual sense of adventure and depth it provided as you unlocked castles, avoided dragons and searched for the chalice. Next up, we entered the 80s with Space Invaders, which technically came out in the arcade in 1978, but this home version for the Atari 2600 came out in 1980. It certainly had a lot of gameplay options, but navigating the options or game settings was actually quite a chore, as the 11 different gameplay options translated into 112 different variations you had to navigate through. I'm flicking through all the games now, I'm up to 75, 
and you just keep flicking through. I mean, this is ridiculous. The goal of this game was to shoot the space invaders before they landed on Earth, while avoiding the lasers they shot back at you. Now, the cool thing you're seeing here is animated sprites. Like, whoa, jeez, I've always got shot. The more space invaders you shoot, the faster they move around the screen. Oh, no, 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 please don't. <sighs> Did it. After trying the normal variation, I attempted the hardest game variation with features like moving shields and invisible vaders, and trust me, it's ridiculously hard. I can't see what I'm shooting, are there? No, they're there somewhere. I know you are. <laughs> Overall, the gameplay was fun and it was great to see so many animated sprites. Sadly, multicoloured sprites were nowhere to be seen in this game, unless you count the black in the space invaders' eyes, but that really just blends in with the background. Moving forward yet another year in time, I gave viewers the opportunity to jump trains to another console. But the Atari 2600 got the most love once again. But trust me, this next game was a game I certainly didn't love. The great animated and multicoloured sprites gave this game a good first impression and the gameplay was simple and easy to understand. Those are animated sprites and they've got so many colours in them. So multicoloured animated sprites for the bombs and even the baskets are multicoloured. See that guy there, the mad bomber? He has got eight colours in him. Yes, an eight coloured sprite. That beats the six coloured car sprite that we saw in Night Driver from 1978. Basically, the mad bomber at the top was dropping down bombs and it was up to me to catch them. Sure, that sounds easy at first, but each time you catch all the bombs in a wave, you get more points and they come down faster. To top it off, oh. I gave myself the challenge of reaching 1,000 points. So we're 5% of the way there. Can we make it to 1,000? And boy, was that a mistake. Ah, ouch. <laughs> no! Sure, you got more points for the faster waves, but it was extremely challenging to catch them all at the rapid speed. That was the controller's fault. All I need is 278 more points. Controller messed me up. Far out! It's always like at 320 something. <laughs> it's always at the same point! I'm reaching limits of sanity playing this game. <laughs> Seven points. Eventually, however, I made it, and I promised myself that I'd never play that game ever again. 800? 900? Yeah! <laughs> oh, I did it! I got to 1,000 points. That game haunted me so much that I didn't even want to play another Atari 2600 game, which was kind of lucky timing, because four new second gen consoles were released in the next year. I did however only give viewers the opportunity to pick a game for the ColecoVision, or the Atari 2600 successor, the Atari 5200. Like usual though, a game for the Atari console got the most votes. Before playing the 5200 version of Pac-Man, we briefly compared it to the Atari 2600 version and noticed a huge improvement in graphics and gameplay. Right from the start of the game, I was impressed by the fact that it had a title screen with a few options. And that we actually get a title screen, which is pretty awesome. And it says, press one or two if you want a two-player game. Um, you can change the difficulty level and you can start the game. So overall, just to me, having a title screen rather than just jumping straight into a game is something that is nice and welcoming, especially when it gives you options, as opposed to the old game variation system on the Atari 2600. The moment I started playing, I was also impressed with the catchy little tune that played. I love that music at the beginning. The gameplay was simple to understand, and eating pellets while running away from AI-controlled ghosts was super fun. Go away, go away, go away! Go away, go away! Go away, no! No! <laughs> eating larger pellets allowed me to reverse rolls with the ghosts and attempt to catch them myself. Overall, this was a great game, and the higher Atari 5200 resolution made this plenty of fun. I was using a PS4 controller, however, so I wasn't haunted by the infamous Atari 5200 controller, which is often spoken poorly of. After this game, viewers were once again given a chance to pick a game for a non-Atari console, but yet again they chose to stick with the Atari 5200. The name of this next game is Mario Bros, and don't be fooled by this playful little tune at the start of the game, because this game is ultra-violent. And look at the violence in this game. Jump up, punch the floor so hard that it makes that thing go on its back, then kick it off the stage to kill it, 
Talk about violence here. Basically, these pests are in Mario's pipes, preventing him from taking a bath. As he finishes each stage, more difficult pests come along and add some challenge to the game. These are called the side steppers because they step sideways. What a unique name. There are even some bonus levels in which you have to collect the coins before the time runs out, but take a look at those messed up physics. Mario jumps higher than the height of himself, and the gravity is very moonlike. Although going through the levels and seeing the new enemies was fun, it was once again played on a single screen with no new areas or scrolling. And like most games of the era, it was also very repetitive, and the main goal was achieving a high score. Viewers were then given a last chance to pick a second generation console, as from 1985 we were going to focus solely on third generation consoles. Can you guess what they chose? Yup, another Atari 5200 game. This one, titled Pitfall, was certainly interesting as it had us playing as Pitfall Harry searching a game world spanning 255 screens for 32 treasures. Is that a treasure? Oh, finally! Yes! Okay, I've got one! Almost everything on the screen was put there either to kill you or steal some of your points. Similar to life in Australia. Luckily, you had three lives, so if you died only a couple of times, you didn't have to start again, which unfortunately is not what life is like in Australia. Finally, a green bunch of grass that does not involve some danger except for a log that is somehow rolling at a constant speed without losing momentum. That's not even possible. This is a flat surface, it's not a hill. And this scorpion has some super sense, because it's like at the bottom of the screen, trying to follow me around. Okay, let's just run past here. Although this game had 255 screens that could be explored, the lack of scrolling coupled with the screens looking extremely similar to each other made the game feel very repetitive. That black thing is in sync with the blue one, notice? It was nice to see some textured bushes in the background as well as the textured logs, but many other sprites were only made up of a single colour. The most challenging parts of this game were jumping over the crocodiles in the pond and jumping over the scorpions at the bottom of the map. Okay, I'm just gonna skip that area. You kidding me? A scorpion? Oh, I just got over it. It actually turns around. Oh, no, no, no. I just got over one. I'm not gonna want to do this again. Oh. Overall, I didn't do too well and found only a few of the treasures. And the 20 minute time limit was quite off-putting, as I generally hate being rushed in a game. And now before we jump over to third generation consoles, it's time to pick my favourite game of the early 80s. And hands down, my vote goes to Kaboom, because this game, nah, just kidding, that was my least favourite. This time around it was close, but overall, Space Invaders was my favourite game based on the exciting dodge and shoot gameplay with progressively faster stages. Moving on to the third generation now, viewers picked Super Mario Brothers, made in 1985 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Right from the title screen of the game, I was impressed. It actually shows you gameplay on the title screen. Then as I started playing, I was impressed once again by the background music that actually played longer than five seconds, unlike the music in Pac-Man and the older Mario Bros. And finally, we have background music. This is fantastic. Now, unlike the original Mario Brothers, you can kill these guys just by jumping on them. So, that's nice and an easy way rather than punching the floor under you. Although the forward scrolling was smooth, you unfortunately couldn't go backwards. I mean, not often would I go backwards, but if I accidentally run a bit too fast and go, oh, I missed something, then you can't go back where you come from. The Nintendo Entertainment System had a limit of four coloured sprites. So, yes, everything here is multicoloured, and actually I think they did a pretty good job. I mean, those clouds look pretty amazing, and everything else looks great. The life system was also somewhat more advanced than previous games. If you get touched by something while small, you die. Get a mushroom, however, and you're safer as you can take a hit without dying, but this will revert you back to your smaller size. The game world, or should I say worlds, were huge, and when you reached the end of one level, you could enter the next level. Anyway, here we've got to jump across, or before the time runs out, and get the highest point of the flag as possible, not the lowest point as I just got. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, the higher you get, the more points you get, but whatever. Anyway, now you can see we are on world one, but like level two or stage two, I guess you could say. 
So let's go new music here. On top of that, there were even secret areas. Oh, whoa, I found something. What is that? Oh, there we go. Look at this. This looks like a secret. Secret area. I'm up on the clouds. <laughs> and there's smiley face clouds. And I guess you could even say that there were bosses, but the first one was extremely easy. Yes! That was actually pretty easy to defeat Bowser. <laughs> if that was boss battle, that was hopeless. There's a lot more I could say about that game, but for the purpose of keeping things short, we'll move on to the next game now. You can always watch the full episodes of these games by checking out the Gaming Through the Ages Phase 1 playlist. Next up, viewers were given the option to pick a game for the NES or the two new third generation consoles released in 1986, but they stuck with the NES and chose Ghosts and Goblins. This is another one of those games I wish to never speak of again, so let's keep this game segment short. First of all, this game had a little cutscene intro to show off the events taking place before the gameplay started. Okay, here we go. We've got a cutscene. So I'm with, I'm with um, my girl. She's been stolen by the devil. I get into my armour and now I've got to go and save her. At least we get a cutscene, it's a bit crazy, but at least there's something there. It was a side-scroller like Super Mario, and you had a starting weapon that you could throw at enemies, although more weapons could be found later in the game. Nice! The game's world was huge, and I was impressed by the overworld map, showing off how far you'd made it in your journey before you died. Prepare to see this a lot, however, as the life system is extremely unfair. One hit and you lose your armour, another hit and you lose your skin, resulting in your death. And I died so many times that I completely lost count. Oh, this is weird scrolling. The upward scrolling is really weird. I think I'm doing okay. <gasps> no! That looked like the end of the Ice Tower area. There were also extremely difficult enemies and bosses in this game that were almost impossible to beat. Okay, so this is a boss and his name is the Unicorn. Where did he go? Ah! What are you? What the heck? What the heck? How do you beat that boss? He doesn't even look like a unicorn. Anyway, after that ridiculous game, we looked into the future and saw that the first fourth generation console, the PC Engine, was released in Japan in 1987. The US version of the console, named the TurboGrafx-16, wasn't released for another two years, however, so we stuck to the third generation consoles. Yet again, an NES game got the most votes. This time around, we got to take a break from the side-scrollers and had a go of racing. Instead of just being given a car to race with, we were given a choice between a grand total of two cars. We can either use a Ferrari 328 Twin Turbo or an F1 racing machine. Although this game was completely in 2D, it was designed in a way that made it appear somewhat 3D. You could see yourself driving over hills and turning corners, but I can't quite say the physics were realistic here, especially when you crashed into something on the side of the road. Now in the background you can see it is night time, but it looks far out, that is so annoying to hit those trees. Getting to the end of the levels without running out of petrol was quite difficult. Oh, hopefully my car rolls and I pass it. Here we go, it's rolling. Down the hill, come on. Where's the end? Where's the checkpoint? Oh, I didn't make it. How far did I get? Oh, I was quite close as well. But when you did reach the end, you were greeted with a new level that contained its own unique style, along with different cars on the road. Oh, these cars are annoying. Get out of the way. As much as I enjoyed this game though, it was quite repetitive and lacked depth. As more fourth generation consoles were released in Japan, viewers were given their last chance to pick a game on a third generation console. And yet again, a game was chosen for the NES. My viewers obviously enjoyed seeing me rage crit during Ghosts and Goblins because this game entitled Contra had a very similar difficulty level. It started off fairly action packed, but still fairly easy. These graphics, I've got to say, just looking at this, are amazing. I love that you can duck and shoot like that. That just adds an extra... <laughs> the bridge just exploded. An extra, I was about to say an extra element of surprise. Now that was just an element of surprise, you could say. But Contra is a well-known, difficult NES game. And it wasn't until I broke into a large base that I discovered the endless horror. We got in! I think that's stage one done. 
Isn't this supposed to be a hard game? Oh no, this is not good. I can't even think. My God. I I can't do that. Sure, the pseudo 3D effects were cool in there, but it made it hard to judge where the bullets were in relation to your body, as well as where to aim, and I just died over and over. No! Finally, when I thought I'd made it through that segment of the game, I was introduced to a boss, and well, here's what happened. Do it, 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 do it! Do it, do it! No, they're winning my- Yeah! We did it, we did it, we did it, is this the end? No, what's this? I can't do a boss now! Please. No! Go, 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 go. We're almost there. This, this one, this one's left. Yes. No, no, no! That's a Let's just say after this game, I was happy to say goodbye to the 8-bit world, because as we came to the end of the 80s, we checked out the specs of two fourth generation consoles and were impressed by their support for larger sprite sizes and more sprites on the screen at once. Viewers then voted for a game on one of these fourth generation consoles and Golden Axe for the Sega Genesis got the most votes. As I was so used to 8-bit gaming at the time, I was blown away by the 16-bit graphics here as well as the ultra-large sprites. Look at these incredible trees, look at those rocks there, and the detail in this sprite, and how big this sprite is. At first I didn't know what to do when I saw enemies, but before long I figured it out. Good, 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 I'm scared. Don't get me, don't get me. Uh, I'm jumping, I'm whacking. Uh, just, why would you whack? Yeah, I threw somebody. Yes! Oh, I can whack and hit. Oh, nuts, I got hit myself. I'm just sitting here amazed, like, you can see the... I, I can't, I was, I was just about to say you can actually see the eyes on those massive trolls there, but you actually can't, because <laughs> they've got their eyes closed or something, but just like the detail, you can see their belly buttons, I mean you couldn't see an individual character's belly button in an 8-bit game as far that I played anyway. Eventually the whole game and fighting system became somewhat repetitive. Move to the next area, jump and kill everybody, move to another area, do the same. And the sound effects are pretty good actually, but the music in this sounds less electronic now. I could imagine a real instrument making that. It was good to see the addition of rideable creatures in this game, and magic, which made things slightly less repetitive. It did have a storyline that progressed as you reached the end of each stage, but I never quite made it to the end. Okay, time to pick my favourite game from the late 80s. Purely based on the amount of fun I had as opposed to the graphics, my vote goes to Super Mario Bros. It had smooth, adventurous gameplay with fun to defeat enemies. The other games I played were either too difficult or repetitive, leaving me either frustrated or fairly bored. As we entered the 1990s, we were introduced to Ghostbusters on the Sega Genesis, which is set directly after the events that took place in the 1984 Ghostbusters movie. This game was 16-bit like Golden Axe, so the graphics once again impressed me. Although, the house itself that I was searching for ghosts in was very abnormal. Even more so than the ghosts themselves that I was attempting to bust. Wait, 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 okay. This is a house? So if you want to get around your own house, you've got to jump over these things, try not to die. Also, what kind of lady has this kind of stuff stored in her house? <laughs> I don't want to go in that room, it's lethal. Go, 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 go. Oh, thank goodness. So I've got a bomb. Ah, uh, that bomb exploded and killed me. How is that even fair? Here I think I'm going to open this thing up for money. And what? This, I should report this woman. She has bombs in her house. Big bags of money and bombs. She's like a bank robber. Anyway, strange things aside, this game has a storyline and the conversations that take place when the Ghostbusters have their discussions appear on the screen as text next to a picture of the person talking. A group picture also appears at the bottom. Although this isn't fancy, it is clear and easy to understand who is talking and the images are of decent quality. This game also wasn't as linear as other games, as it allowed me to choose which level or location I wanted to visit, as opposed to just dropping me into a location and giving me no choice. Home sweet home, if we can bust the ghosts in this lady's home, that little house you see there, we will get $2,000. If we can bust them in the apartment, 
we get $4,000. If we can do it in the Woody House, we get $6,000. And if we do it in the High Rise Building, we'll get $8,000. The in-game money could also be spent on different items and enhancements for our Ghostbusting gear. Bubble Projectile. Bubble. As silly as this bubble projectile sounds, I'm gonna buy it. When bubbles are fired from the gun... We're shooting bubbles. I thought bubble was some acronym or some, like, let me make something up on the spot. Big, ugly boom blast, legs everywhere slaughtered. <laughs> That's what I thought this thing was, but it's not. I can't believe there's actually a bubble gun in this game, Oh. Also, like in most other games, this game has bosses, which I admit are quite difficult. <gasps> Crud, its head came off, it's haunted me, I'm so freaked out! After playing Ghostbusters, we looked forward another year to 1991, which introduced the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the super expensive Neo Geo. Even with these new consoles released, viewers chose another game on the Sega Genesis. Here we are with yet another side-scroller, yet this one, titled Sonic the Hedgehog, involves a character called Sonic who can move super rapidly. Basically, the evil Dr. Robotnik has imprisoned tiny animals in machines, and it's up to Sonic to save them. You will notice little animals become freed as you jump on robots scattered throughout the levels. As long as you are spinning in mid-air, you can generally defeat enemies, but it doesn't make you safe from their bullets. <laughs> but there we go, see how it's like easier than Super Mario in the fact that you can just kind of... I'm talking about how easy it is that I get hit. In the way you just kind of... jump. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> the levels were quite big and had multiple paths you could take, so two different people playing this game could have slightly different experiences by the end. There were also a wide range of levels to complete, and like usual, say hello to boss battles. Oh, what's this? Uh oh, Dr. Robotnik! The graphics here were very impressive, and although it was 2D, many objects such as the rings you collect appeared 3D, but this was all just to do with clever sprite animations. The parallax scrolling backgrounds here, as opposed to the blank blue sky in Super Mario Bros., made this game feel a lot more alive. Next up, viewers decided to give the Sega Genesis a break and pick a game for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Super Mario Kart. Moving back into the world of pseudo, but not really 3D racing games, I was right away fairly impressed by the wider selection of characters available, as opposed to only two in Rad Racer. With Donkey Kong, we've got Yoshi, and we've got Luigi. You can feel that the world of 3D is right around the corner, but it's not quite here yet. Well, it is elsewhere, but not quite in this game. Now, just look at that. This looks 3D. You would think that that cart is a 3D model spinning around and you can see Mario's front, his back, the wheels, the cart. It is just incredible, but this is not 3D. This is pseudo 3D. What you're basically looking at is a sprite that has lots of states. So this is still a 2D image, but it's got lots of states. They've drawn the front, side, back, and all of these things to make it look like a 3D object. Stepping into the actual races now shows off the brilliant pseudo 3D appearance of Mode 7 on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. As you race and turn corners, the world turns around you. However, a resolution upgrade would certainly make this experience nicer. Due to the lower resolution we've got here, things that are far from you really look pixelated. Coins on the ground can be picked up to slightly increase your speed and power-ups, such as the red shells, can be used to slow down your enemies. Oh come on, please liquid power-up. Yes! I need this! Get him, get him, get him! Ah, oh, I came second! It was great to see such a wide range of levels here, but overall this game did become somewhat repetitive over time. After playing this game, we jumped into the fifth generation, which started to introduce some real 3D capable consoles, able to render 10,000 to 20,000 polygons per second. Viewers then chose a 3D game on the Panasonic 3DO, which was ultra expensive in the day, so it was a treat to experience top of the range console gaming in the early 90s with Crash and Burn. Although this game actually was 3D, it should be noted that not everything you see is 3D. Some things are still just 2D sprites, like the fire that appears on your car when it's heavily damaged. The tracks themselves had quite crazy layouts with huge hills and weird road surfaces, which was unrealistic, but the textures were quite decent for an early 3D game. You can see all the individual little yellow lines on the road going past you as you drive. Oh, and that guy's getting shot at. Okay, I'm coming fifth, fourth, 
There was a huge sense of emptiness felt though with the background, which made the tracks feel like they were floating in the air, rather than being attached to an actual living and breathing world. The game also included full motion video. Love close in combat. I've survived this long because I live by two credos. Number one, everyone is your enemy. And number two, a dead enemy can't kill you. Yeah, it was quite corny though. The secret to winning is to never, ever make a mistake. You master that tactic and you will always destroy your opponent. Okay, last one, I promise. To get the crowd screaming, I use a lot of swerving in my attacks. It makes me harder to hit and it looks pretty cool too. <laughs> there was also an upgrade shop in this game with multiple upgrades to improve your odds of winning races. And that there are guns, energy, missiles, specials, armors and hazards. So we'll have to get this one, more lead means more dead. You've got 300 MO, let's get it. Bye. Unlike Super Mario Kart, you could actually use weapons to completely knock your opponents out of the race. Oh yes, I shot someone. I actually blew up another car by, oh crud. I might need to do a pit stop myself. After playing this game, we discussed how new 5th generation consoles, such as the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn, were released in Japan in 1994, yet not in the US until 1995, so viewers couldn't pick games for these consoles yet. Instead, they picked yet another 3D racing game on the 3DO, Need for Speed, which was re-released on the PlayStation 1 and Sega Saturn in 1996. At this point in the series, I decided to fill the blank space in the top right corner of my videos. To celebrate my birth year in 1994, I'm officially filling up this blank space above me with the console we're playing this on and the game cover itself, just so there's something up there and it's not just a blank space, because that was bugging me. So there's something up there now. The options screen where you choose the track, car and settings was also quite unique, especially without text. I can't quite say it was straightforward right away though. They've tried to go for like a, it looks like a scrapbook style of some kind and ripped out pictures here and there. There was a great selection of different cars available as well as tracks, but where this game really shined above Crash and Burn is all to do with its backgrounds that removed the roads floating in the air feeling while blending in with the 3D objects so well that you wouldn't even know it was a background. You can see kind of a background way up in the distance. Um, of a mountain over there and some buildings. You can barely notice the fact that, that it look, just looks like this game has fantastic draw distance. It really blends in really well. This is so realistically done. I'm just amazed. Although look, a lot of those models, the building models are the same. Like, we're going past a lot of the same building. It says red buildings, then it's those units. Although the physics in this game weren't perfect, it was great to see multiple 3D cars smashing, spinning and going airborne after a high-speed collision. Anyway, let's come outside our car. Whoa! <laughs> that was an insane crash. <laughs> oh, come on. Even with all the cars and tracks though, this game once again felt repetitive after racing for a while, and although the car engine sounds were quite decent, they did at times sound a little vacuum cleaner like. The full motion video was cool though, and I loved getting feedback about how well or poorly I drove. Winning isn't about how many cars you total. Right? Remember, it's a license to drive. It's not a license to destroy. Next up, we discussed the release of the new Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn, which were not only cheaper than the 3DO, but also more powerful, being able to render a lot more polygons per second. Popularity of the 3DO not only began to drop in real life in 1995, but also in this series. Viewers picked a PlayStation game next, but before we discuss that, it's time to choose my favourite game from the early 90s. It was a close tie this time around between Sonic the Hedgehog and Super Mario Kart, but in the end I'd say Super Mario Kart was my favourite game when it comes to gameplay, due to the thrill of racing along in a kart while also playing around with the various power-ups. Next up, prepare to fight with Mortal Kombat 3 on the PlayStation. If you thought Mario Brothers from 1983 was violent, then skip ahead a few minutes in the video because this one features countless variations of punching, kicking, tripping and throwing, as well as a bunch of other things I can't even name. Top that off with jelly-like blood that flies out of bodies that have just been attacked and you just... 
I don't even have words for this one. Let's just say the G rating got kicked out of the window and landed in a bowl of red jelly that hasn't quite set yet. Focusing solely on the graphics here, you'll see that this is a 2D game with sprites made from digitised versions of real world actors. Although the frame rates for the characters could be a little higher, it does still look decently smooth. The backgrounds in this game are also of a high quality, and the characters' shadows are also quite decent. The addition of papers flying in the wind in one of the levels also helps bring the world alive. Although there was a wide range of characters to select from, I must say it was an extremely repetitive game, but if you like fighting and could never grow tired of it, then this game is for you. If not, just avoid it. After playing this game, I mentioned that another 5th generation console, the Nintendo 64, was released in 1996. This system still used cartridges, however, unlike the PlayStation 1, so it was quite limited with storage space for games. That didn't deter people though, and right away people decided to jump trains and pick a game for it. Welcome to yet another Mario game, and say another hello to the world of 3D. Well, as we soon found out, mostly 3D. Look at that 3D object with that 3D camera going around a 3D castle. Basically, Princess Peach invited us to have a cake with her at a castle, but like usual, Bowser just had to mess things up. The controls here felt quite natural, especially in the way you could just push the analog stick in all directions and use different amounts of force to make Mario sneak, walk or run. You can walk slow if you just push it a little bit, then you can speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up to a kind of bit of a little fast walking pace here and a jog running along. The game was also revolutionary in the way its levels were laid out. Instead of picking levels to play from a menu, you ran around the castle looking for paintings to jump into, as these took you to different worlds. By collecting stars, you could unlock new areas and find even more paintings to jump into. And reacting to the star's power, the door slowly opens. But watch out for the bosses. You can't attack them right away. Look for their weaknesses first. So what am I supposed to do with this guy? Crud, 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 crud. I, I can't get behind him, he runs so fast. Just jump up on him, jump and smash. Take a closer look at the world you're moving around in though and you will notice it isn't quite perfect. For example, your shadow is always a perfect circle. And did you notice something odd about the trees? Ah, uh, look at that, as I'm turning around the tree, I'm not seeing other sides of the tree, I'm always seeing the same side. So what's obviously happening here is that these trees are just a single 2D sprite. Also, take a closer look at the fences. It's not 3D, that is once again 2D, because as you can see when the camera angle goes like right straight onto it, it practically disappears, meaning that it's missing any depth which is the third dimension. Although the world had repetitive and in some cases very blurry textures, the gameplay itself was very diverse and varied, which kept me entertained the whole way through. After playing this game, viewers decided to jump back to the PlayStation and pick yet another violent game. Grand Theft Auto. Although the graphics in this game were nothing special for its era, it did have a revolutionary open world with non-linear gameplay. There were quite a few missions in this game, but if you just wanted to mess around and do whatever you liked, you could. You can hide in a bin! <laughs> bin dancing, okay. So that bin, you can't see different angles of it. When I'm up here, I can see the exact same thing I can see as if I'm down here. So definitely the ground is completely flat 2D. All vehicles on the street could also be broken into and driven, but watch out for the cops, because if you're caught breaking the law, they're gonna come after you. Yes, I'm on the bike. Okay, where do I go? Oh crap, they're shooting at me. Go, 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 go. Oh no, get back on the bike! Quickly. Go, 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 go. The cops almost, oh no, I'm on my bike again. Go, 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 go. Oh, I got busted. Missions could be received and accepted by answering payphones. This guy dumped a car in North East Park, find it before the cops do, or die. Oh great! What motivation! Unfortunately, the top-down camera angle was off-putting, and the controls were difficult to manage at times. I love the concept of this game, the cool concept in this open world, and being able to explore a city, and doing missions if you want, and trying to get to this million dollars, but it just really needs to be done without this top-down angle. Oh, is this stolen from a bank? Oh, cool sound Oh, the cops are after us! Next up, viewers decided to give the PlayStation the flick and let me have another kick at a Nintendo 64 game. The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. This game certainly had a very peaceful and friendly vibe to it, and once again, say hello to the world of 3D, with the camera placed behind the player. 
Obviously here they're trying to save some of the resources and processing power on the Nintendo 64 so they only have that guy visible or other people in general visible when you're near them. Okay, I see. Oh, can you get away from me? Your legs are just so... What? What? How do you slide along the ground? You're not even walk. Look, I'm actually normal. I can walk. But you are just weird. You just slide along with the ground with your legs out. We played this game as Link, and although most of the world was 3D, his treehouse was actually just 2D, although it was created using pre-rendered 3D graphics. The game seems to have quite a slow pace as it's more about solving puzzles, talking to people and finding objects, as opposed to being an action-packed shooter. The game is set in a fantasy world and its story is quite involved. So involved in fact that it would take you 27 hours on average to complete the game. The game also has a shop you can visit to buy items. Why did they build the bench so high if you can't even use it properly? What's he going to spend his whole day jumping? Or maybe he does it for exercise. Although the way you make money in this game is... Odd. It's like he's trying to pull a rock out of the ground, but he's not really having much success. Can I? Oh, cool. After this game, viewers were introduced to the first sixth generation console, the Dreamcast, which had a very interesting memory card. This console had a relatively large controller that had a slot in the top allowing you to plug in a VMU, aka Visual Memory Unit. Its basic purpose was to be a memory card for the Sega Dreamcast, but it could do so much more than that due to the built-in LCD screen which can even be seen when the VMU is plugged into the controller. This allowed players to look down at the controller to see various stats such as their health bar and even play mini games on the VMU itself which had a directional pad and buttons which is extremely cool for just a memory card. The VMU also had a real-time clock, file manager and the ability to play sound. All that exciting info about the Dreamcast didn't tempt viewers however and instead they chose another Nintendo 64 game, Donkey Kong 64. It seems longer games with in-depth stories and puzzles are now becoming a trend as Donkey Kong 64 takes over 30 hours to complete. I was impressed right away to see that unlike Link, Donkey Kong has a real 3D treehouse. It looks like you could jump onto the table but it kind of, there's an invisible wall that stops you. Um, but I could probably, yeah, I can jump onto this and it swings around. Although walking in and out of it still isn't seamless and waiting for a loading screen is required. As for the goal of the game, it starts off simple. Save your friends that have been kidnapped. But before long, it gets ultra complicated. But only if you bring me 15 banana medals. They look like this. It's a golden banana. But we need some purple thing, obviously, to be able to access it. If you could manage to get hold of any keys, please bring them back here to open my locks. Don't think for one minute you're coming in here without showing me some of your stupid golden bananas. But you'll need to find me some of my original blueprints. Blueprints now! So now we're looking for blueprints, golden bananas, uh, things to unlock all the doors, more teleporters, more keys. I think I'm going insane with all these things I'm trying to keep track of. Some 3D people and objects still disappear at certain distances to save hardware resources, but the way houses appear and disappear is actually pretty unique. This game was full of surprises, depth, items, goals, and even pretty epic bosses. Oh nuts, that thing looks evil. Oh crud, and I'm right in front of it! Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Next up, as we enter the year 2000, the PlayStation 2 was released, and we compared its specs to the PlayStation 1. Although viewers were given the opportunity to pick a PlayStation 2 game, it seems that the excitement of the Dreamcast finally caught up with them, and they voted for Crazy Taxi. Before we check that out, however, it's time to pick my favourite game from the late 1990s. It was a close tie between Donkey Kong 64 and Super Mario 64, but in the end, I choose... Uh, I honestly really can't pick here. Donkey Kong is fun, but it seems to have a little bit too much depth and goals. Mario's world is cool, but it could do with a slight bit more depth and story. I think I'll just have to place these games here as a tie. Okay. So Crazy Taxi on the Dreamcast. Graphics-wise, this was a step forward from other games we've been playing recently, but it lacked story and depth. Basically, you drive around, pick up passengers, and take them to the destinations they request. You have a set time limit to pick up as many passengers as possible to make as much money as possible. Take too long, though, and your passengers will just jump out. You suck! Look at the time! Oh, <laughs> she just jumped into that van! I was pretty surprised to find real-world shops in the game. Is that KFC? 
Are you kidding me, Kentucky Fried Chicken? There's an actual pizza hut here. But the world wasn't yet indistinguishable from real life. Your taxi had a high polygon count, but other cars didn't and had blurry textures as well as many of the buildings. But there's so many different building types. I mean, every single building here basically just looks different. However, did you just see that? Popping graphics are still a thing so far in this early sixth generation that we're experiencing. Moving on to 2001, the GameCube and Xbox were released and we soon discovered that the Dreamcast had the lowest specs of the sixth generation consoles. When given a choice to pick their next game, viewers chose Grand Theft Auto 3 on the PlayStation 2. This game was a lot better than the original version on the PlayStation back in 1997, as it was in 3D and it had a more in-depth story and better mission system. There was also voice acting for the characters as well as fantastic sound effects for all aspects of the game. I know a place on the edge of the red light district where we can lay low, but my hands are all messed up, so you better drive, brother. The world was absolutely huge and fun to explore. Not just huge, however, but also detailed. And although the textures were quite blurry, you could still read text from posters around the world. These random, like, movie posters. She loved to be taken up a dark alley. <laughs> and, and look, you've got the meowch. A <laughs> kitten club. Uh, <laughs> like, it's, it's not like just like a random boat in the middle of nowhere. It's like there's actual, you could imagine that this is a working cargo yard of some kind because you can see cargo on the boat, then it offloads here. And the artificial intelligence here was amazing and you could just sit back and watch the world carry on by itself with cars following the road rules and people walking around with different styles and paces. There's a train going by randomly and the other cars on the street are just driving around. The traffic lights are going red and green. This whole world just feels like, let's pull over, we're pulling over. Let's just sit here for a moment. There's people walking along the sides of the road. Different people are walking differently to each other. And there were cop chases too. Oh crud, let's get out of our car. Crud crud, they got out too! No, 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 let me get in this. Go, 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 go. There's little park benches and bins on the side. Uh, we almost fell. <laughs> you see the cop just went down here. Oh, crud, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. Go, 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 go. No! Anyway, moving on to 2002, viewers decided to give the GameCube a go and pick yet another Mario-based game. This one was quite different to the other Mario games we played in the series and had a strong focus on water, and not surprisingly, the water looked extremely fluid and realistic. And when running on the sand, you could even leave footprints. Not only does a tree shadow look good, but Mario's shadow looks good, and Mario's shadow can even overlap with the tree shadow. You can see all sides of this. This is not like Super Mario 64 where it was a 2D sprite that always faces the player. This is a real 3D tree, and that is pretty awesome. Basically, we were in charge of cleaning up an island as punishment because a Mario lookalike had been spreading all this gross goo everywhere. Our water spraying backpack could do a lot more than just spray water though. It could even let us hover around by spraying water directly onto the ground. Lighting was also done well, and darkness shrouded parts of the island due to the mess. This is this tiny bit of light here, and everywhere else it's dark, that is freaky. It was great to finally have a decent amount of voice acting in a Mario game. Previous games were limited by the cartridges on the Nintendo 64, but the extra space available with discs fixed this issue on the GameCube, even though they were smaller discs. Though it is daytime in Delfino Plaza, our poor residents tremble beneath a veil of darkness. Anyway, jumping back to the PlayStation 2, viewers picked a game that was somewhat a Simpsons-styled parody of Grand Theft Auto, known as The Simpsons Hit and Run. This game had a somewhat limited open world as opposed to Grand Theft Auto, as you only really had one road to drive along that occasionally had eternal split that just led to a later point on the same road. The gameplay was fun, however, and packed with humour and tutorials that parodied how slow and boring other game tutorials can be. Let's get into our car. Okay, homeboy, here's how you drive this crap box. Press the X button to accelerate and use the left analog stick or directional button to steer. The circle button is your brake and reverse. And These the tutorials are handling. very slow you know, and could be like done a lot quicker. Ever. The world was a decent 3D recreation of the Simpsons world from the 2D cartoon series. However, its AI sometimes suffered. For example, cars didn't mind stopping for me, but they had no consideration for the little girl I'd kicked onto the road. I'm sorry, this is a... At least there's... Oh no, she got run over! 
<laughs> by the school bus. Sadly, when moving from an indoor to an outdoor environment, loading has to take place, so this isn't a seamless process. After playing this game, viewers picked yet another Grand Theft Auto game on the PlayStation 2, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. If you thought Grand Theft Auto 3 had a huge and interesting world, this one will just blow you away. It had multiple cities, beaches, a desert area, and secret bases, as well as mountains and shops. Let's check out an afro. So somehow I was like almost bald, then he shaves my hair and I've got all this hair. <laughs> a little bit unrealistic, it would be cool if this game had like a hair growth system where you have to wait for your hair to grow over time and then get a haircut. You could have haircuts, order food and even gain a large variety of skills such as piloting, bike riding, driving, running and so much more. Okay, here we go, we've made it to the... I think that is the fastest I've seen a car come to a stop in my whole life. This game had a huge amount of storyline and missions to complete, but overall, it seems as time goes on with the decades of gaming, swearing is becoming more and more common. It seems, however, that draw distances are still a problem, and you can see as I fly this plane that buildings fade out in the distance, even though they technically aren't that far away. And of course, there are cop chases. Whoa, we're falling down in this place, I don't know what you call it. It's like you can see all the rocks and stuff. <laughs> I went over that cop car, look at this. Next up as we entered 2005, the first 7th generation console, the Xbox 360, was released as a successor to the original Xbox and it was a ton more powerful. Viewers however stuck to the PlayStation 2 and shows, well before we get to that, let's choose my favourite game from the early 2000s. A lot of the games we played here were open world, but my favourite was Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, due to its insane amount of gameplay depth and its huge world size. Anyway, moving on to 2005, we played The Sims 2 on the PlayStation 2, which is a game that simulates real life. Basically, we took control of a sim. Oh, look at me, I'm running around with some food. Doesn't even say what kind of food it is, it is just classified at the bottom there as food. Monitored its needs, such as hunger, and completed its wants, such as jumping on the trampoline. <laughs> Why not just do these things in real life, you may ask? What's the point of having a game that's almost like real life? Well, it's all about speed. Time in the game moves faster than in real life, so you can play for a few hours in the game to achieve multiple promotions and upgrade your house with new rooms and items, which would normally take years in real life. You can also start a family and do all that fun stuff within a few hours of gameplay as well. The graphics were also decent, but not perfect. The walls were literally paper thin. These walls are more than paper thin, these walls have no depth at all. See how they disappear entirely when I go... So really, these are pixel thin walls. One thing I missed about real life in this game though was being able to leave my backyard. Okay, so let's meet somebody new. We're gonna make our way out onto the street here, and across can't seem to cross the road. Let's go across the road. Across the road! There is an invisible wall here preventing me from crossing the road. Maybe it's some sort of safety mechanic so that we don't get run over by a car. Instead we'll just make our way to our neighbour's place. That's how we can meet somebody new. What's going on? There's also an invisible wall here. We've got to escape this place, we are like trapped. Moving on to 2006, another two 7th generation consoles joined the Xbox 360, the PS3 and the Nintendo Wii. Although the Wii was somewhat underpowered, it had the bonus of motion controls which encouraged users to stand up and get active in front of their TVs. Next up, say hello to the 16x9 aspect ratio that replaced the old 4x3 ratio. In less technical terms, say hello to widescreen TVs and goodbye to me as there was no more black bars at the side anymore. Anyway, this next game, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, was a lot like the 1998 Zelda game we played. It was based on having conversations with people and working out somewhat challenging puzzles that I admit I struggled with at times. The game didn't really have any voice acting and instead, made you read dialogue off the screen. This wasn't due to hardware limitations though, it's apparently just a Zelda thing. The world does make up for this however, and as you can see it's full of detail, and even the flowers are animated when you run through them. They're individual flowers that actually move as we move. You can even ride a horse to speed up your travels through the world. Go 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 go! No! You ran off! You're sneaky! Come back here! Hopping forward to 2007 now, viewers chose yet another Mario game and boy did this one look impressive. Yes! These are individually animated flowers. As I trample them, they wobble. Okay, let's just find out where we're going here. Wow, that water looks amazing. Look at how the water 
is reflecting the castle. The storyline was quite in depth here, but once again it started off with the overdone scenario where Bowser takes Princess Peach and it's up to Mario to save her. But look at this epic method he uses to take her. Yup, this game has a space focus, and due to the small planet sizes, you can literally see yourself walking around highly detailed spheres that were quite different to each other. Look at this ground, it's not just, you know, a flat ground. This planet once again looks different to all the other planets we've seen. You can see how its ground is, like, it's got this pipe going through it, and these, like, I don't know, weird hexagon nails holding it together, and it's shiny, it's reflecting stuff. It's just really cool. Look at that, as we're looking through this pink thing, that spaceship over there is actually getting distorted through it and the stars are getting distorted. This is just incredible. The coolest thing here was being able to jump from one planet to another without any loading screens. And go. Moving on to 2008, viewers went a little Mario crazy, so I had to kind of ban Mario games for the rest of the series. Anyway, this version of Mario Kart was 3D, unlike the pseudo 3D Mario Kart we saw back in 1992 on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. There was a wider range of characters to select from, and each character had different vehicles they could use, including motorbikes. There weren't any coins in this game, but it was cool to see the 3D power-up blocks spinning around with their interesting and colourful textures. The tracks were also very decent and contained many throwbacks to previous Mario games, and even old tracks from previous Mario Kart games. From the looks of it, these two top cuts seem to be brand new levels, while these ones at the bottom... Oh, look at that! Ghost Valley! That's the one we originally played in, um the 1992 version on the SNES. Many of the tracks also had multiple paths you could take, which added to the strategy and challenge of this racing game. It was also very hard to find any 2D sprites hiding within these well-crafted 3D worlds. These trees... These trees are 3D, okay. We do have 3D trees there. Now these people here... Yes, Shy Guy and all these guys, they are 3D as well. And the flowers... The flowers are 3D as well. Yes, a lot of things actually here, even this pole is 3D. Next up, the viewers chose one last game on the Nintendo Wii, and this one was another throwback to a 90s game in the series, Ghostbusters the Video Game. Like usual, there was ghostly activity detected, and it was up to the Ghostbusters to bust the ghosts. Can we please call Winston and tell him this night off is officially ended? Way ahead of you, Peter. Janine is paging him now. Who is going to pay for all of this? What was interesting here, however, was the ability to point your Wii remote at the screen to control the ghost catching beam. The environment was also highly destructible, which you could see as I aimed the beam at various types of furniture. I just want to destroy this room, wait a sec. That is just absolutely awesome. Even the paintings on the walls and the you know, wall burn marks and everything. There was also a decent amount of detail and objects in the game that made it feel much more alive, but the Wii's limited hardware prevented this from looking photorealistic and lifelike. Look at this room here! Now overall, these graphics are pretty detailed. I mean, you've got books stacked up like that on top of each other. Um, you've got the car out the front. There's quite a few objects here that make up this room and kind of fill it and give it character. Also, the game overall had an intentional, cartoony look. You'll see that your warranty on rehaunting expired some time ago. You should have taken the extended service agreement. Photorealism came in the next episode, however, with a PlayStation 3 game. But before we get to that, it's time to choose my favourite game from the late 2000s. Due to the varied, unique gameplay as well as stunning visuals, my vote goes to Super Mario Galaxy. After using the Wii, an underpowered 7th generation console for the last 4 years, it's time to give the PS3 a go, and boy did this next game, Gran Turismo 5, look realistic. This racing simulator first let us choose from a selection of over a thousand cars to buy, but with our starting money we obviously couldn't buy anything fancy. The graphics here and the dealership screen were amazing, the cars spun around in 3D with a photorealistic appearance. After searching for a while, we decided to go with the 2007 Toyota Vitz. There were also a wide selection of races to choose from, but starting off, the Sunday Cup was best suited for us. As this was a real driving simulator though, I can't quite say the races were action packed with amazing courses, especially driving at Toyota Vitz speeds. But there are Ferraris and Lamborghinis in the game too when you can afford them later. 
The courses themselves didn't look as great as the cars, and many of the in-game cars lacked interiors, and were models borrowed from the earlier PS2 Gran Turismo games. It was still a realistic driving and racing simulator though, rather than an arcadey racing game. Next up, say hello to Dead Island, another PS3 game, but this one's about zombies. Right away as I booted up the game, I was already impressed with the graphics of the hotel room, but I soon realised two things. One, the lighting system, at least in the hotel room, was pre-rendered and not real-time. Then out the window, the natural sunlight is just beaming in. You can see it on the ground, in strips because of the verticals, and then you can just see it kind of glowing as we look through here. So the lighting system in this game is absolutely amazing. You, you know, the light extends all the way along the carp here and kind of stops here. Do we have a shadow? The shadow side of things is looking a little bit odd here. Okay, look. Light is coming through this window right? And it's kind of reflecting onto this carpet. Where is our shadow? And two, the whole island was infested with zombies. Um, I saw something walking down there. It's the infected! Run! Run to the storage room! Are they chasing me? Oh crap, they're chasing me! Go, 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 go! This game had advanced systems involving levelling in skills and also allowed you to free roam the island if you didn't mind being attacked by zombies every few seconds. This is a lovely pool. I'd love to just go swimming in here, but there's too many dead people around for me to even... Oh my goodness, can we go in the pool? Yes! Let's come in. Oh, they can go in the pool too! Okay. <laughs> Why did I think zombies couldn't go in water? That is obviously not the case. Let's just run! Let's just run, 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 run! There's too many zombies to even think about you know, trying to kill here, we just got to escape them. Although the in-game world wasn't quite as big as we first thought, however, and the other islands in the distance were just there for show. You couldn't actually swim to them. I wonder if you can get a boat and just escape yourself. Like, that looks like a separate island over there. Can we go over there? Can you even hear the water sound here and listen to this? You are leaving the playable area. Oh, crud and then it just throws us back in here again. As 2012 came along, we briefly discussed the first major 8th generation console, the Wii U, and its controller with the screen on it. Unfortunately, however, for this series, we didn't have access to 8th generation consoles, so we stuck with the PS3. Next up, we played a much more casual game, Zen Pinball 2. Just because this was a casual game, however, it didn't mean the graphics were terrible. In fact, they were absolutely brilliant. There were lights everywhere and things just looked and sounded amazing. The ball physics were ultra realistic. And listen to this ball rolling sound. In 2013, two new 8th generation consoles hit the market, the PS4 and the Xbox One. But we went old school and stuck to the PS3. And boy was this next game a release we didn't want to miss. A new Grand Theft Auto game. This game not only had a huge open world that was heavily detailed, its graphics were insanely realistic, and there was so much variety in the world around you. Just check out that cityscape, it's incredible! There were also a huge amount of characters in the long story, and their voice acting was well done, although the swearing just felt a little bit too over the top. You couldn't go a couple of sentences without a swear word thrown in. Let's, let's just get out of here. Oh, and what do you notice when we get out of here? What just happened? Yes, I, I can see that we're outside. That is kind of obvious that we're outside, and that's what you'd expect to happen when you walk outside your house. But what is really cool about this, look at that. No loading screen. There were even wild animals and roller coasters and just way too much for me to describe here. So just go ahead and watch the full episode. Oh, what was that sound? I'm actually a bit scared. <gasps> ah! Now I'm really scared! Okay, okay, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going. Ah, no, 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 let me get in this car! Oh my gosh. Next up, I played Ace Combat Infinity from 2014 on the PlayStation 3, which had me flying around engaging in aerial combat in the year 2019. The near future we experienced, however, was not a future set in the same timeline as us. The game featured very long cutscenes and videos that described the alternate history leading up to the events occurring as we played the game. Thanks to the railgun network, damage was kept to a bare minimum. Only about enough to destroy the entire world order. And have a listen to all the voices as you play this game. You certainly do feel like you're part of a team completing an important mission. All units, eliminate them before there's any more damage. Evacuation order out for the coastal areas. This keeps up though, the evacuation zones might be in danger too. 
The game was free to play and microtransactions were scattered everywhere. The worlds we saw were huge with countless 3D polygons for the buildings, however not all buildings were 3D. Many of them were just part of the flat and blurry ground texture. Now finally we move on to the last game we played in phase 1. Don't worry though, there will be a phase 2 one day. Anyway, we stuck with the aging PS3 and played Battlefield Hardline. In this game we played as a cop on the job arresting people, kicking down doors, investigating and so on. The destruction we saw in an apartment when making a raid was impressive, but somewhat pre-scripted rather than real time. Oh crud! Oh no, oh, uh, what's going on, what's going on? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. oh, jeez. Oh, I didn't expect this. I'm in control and I just shot everybody. Oh, crud. The environments were very well detailed though, both inside and out, and it appeared that everywhere we went, something was always happening, making the world feel alive. That guy looks suspicious. Hey! This guy. Sorry, man. Not one I'm on duty. Okay, okay. All right, well, officer, you, you, you uh, take care of the neighborhood. Be safe. All right. Fuck you. Yeah, slow down. Okay. Is uh, there a problem, ma'am? Lynn doesn't fucking fit. Well, good luck, ma'am. You. The game was strongly story based however, and there was no free room, which explains why the world seemed so alive. It was all pre-scripted as a linear experience rather than a random open one. Wait, wait till I get closer. Here we go. After playing this game, we discussed the next releases in 2016, such as the new Xbox One Slim and the Slim and Pro versions of the PS4. We also mentioned the release of PlayStation VR and talked about other headsets made for PC. Gaming through the ages phase 1 the console phase is now finished. However, we're about to make the jump back to 1975 and start phase 2, the computer phase. Or as some of you may call it, the PC Master Race phase as opposed to the console peasant phase. To ensure there's enough interest in the series however, Phase 2 will be on hold until all Phase 1 videos have at least 2,000 views each, or if this review video has 100,000 views, whatever comes first. Until then however, it's time to vote for a Phase 1 game for me to play from beginning to end. Here's the list of 41 games we played, but I'm going to remove some from the list, so get ready to vote for one of these games. I'm not going to be filming a screen again with a video camera for the PS3 games, and those Wii games were somewhat challenging to play with a PS4 controller, so post-2005 games are out of the question. Also, games with the sole purpose of achieving a high score with no goals beyond that aren't really appropriate for a Let's Play, so those are going to be removed too. Next up, I'm going to remove games who were either ridiculously challenging or didn't have much of a goal or storyline in my opinion, or just weren't my taste in general. And we've got to remove Adventure because I've already beaten that game. Oh boy, it's looking pretty empty now, but I've still got some removing to do. I don't want the Let's Play to be too long, so games over 15 hours will have to be cut out of this list. So in the end, that leaves us with just 6 games to pick from. So start voting now in the comments section, and in a week or two I'll start a full Let's Play for the game that has the most votes. I hope you've enjoyed our journey through time. Don't forget to like this video, and if you haven't already, check out the full Phase 1 episodes. And hey, if Phase 2 is popular, we may jump back again and do Phase 3, the handheld phase. Anyway, I'll see you next time on Gaming Through the Ages.